Hi, this is Rachel, and this is topic 23 in our field supervision curriculum. And today we're going to talk about behavior intervention plans. So last time we spoke about functional behavior assessment and functional analysis and how we determine the function of a behavior. The function of the behavior is just what is the reinforcer, what is what need is that needing for an individual. When we talk about behavior intervention plans, we want to use that information so we know what the individual is, we know why the individual is using this behavior, what need this behavior is meeting for the individual. And we want to develop a behavior intervention plan that's going to help that individual get their needs met in the most efficient and effective way for that setting. So an overly adapted behavior that we want to decrease in a certain setting is still functional, is still meeting the needs of the individual who is using it because we don't engage in behaviors that don't work. So it's meeting a need. We do the functional behavior assessment and the functional analysis to determine what need is being met by that behavior. What are the consequences? What are the reinforcers that are maintaining this behavior? How is this behavior helping the individual meet their needs? Now, for our behavior intervention plan, we want to use that information to identify what, sorry, now that we've identified the behavior, we want to arrange the environment, use my hands as sort of percentages, arrange the environment to meet the individual's needs so that they don't need to use the overly adapted behavior because their needs are being met, and teach the individual how to advocate for themselves getting their need met if the environment isn't supporting them. And then maybe, maybe over at the end, we might need to use extinction if the behavior, overly adapted behavior does occur. However, in practice and in theory, but in my own practice as well, if you do all of this other work about I, you know, arranging the environment and meeting the individual's needs and helping them, to advocate for or, and get their needs met in a more efficient way, you don't have to use extinction. But we are going to talk about it and we're gonna talk about where it falls. So the first step would be um, non-contingent reinforcement. So this is the antecedent half and, and it should be at least half of the work, right? If this is a theoretical 100%, at least 50% should be non-contingent reinforcement. So what that means is that whatever we determined that the learner is getting their need met by whatever that need is, we provide it in the environment. We arrange the environment so that the learner already has that need met. We meet the learner's needs. That should be at least 50% of a behavior intervention is meeting the learner's needs. Give them what they need. If they have a need, they're going to get a need met. If we meet the need, then they don't need to engage in that overly adapted behavior to get the need met because the need is already met. By providing that in the environment, not contingent on anything the individual has to do, just providing it in the environment, that is called non-contingent reinforcement. So say, for example, an individual was um, engaging in a behavior to get Skittles. I could just have Skittles available all the time. They're just out. You can just have Skittles when you want Skittles. I've met the learner's need for Skittles, they don't need to engage in whatever behavior they were using to get Skittles, right? They have their needs met. Um, now, not every reinforcer can be provided at all times in every environment. Skittles maybe being an example, right? Um, maybe we need to put the Skittles away sometimes. Maybe not every environment can have Skittles. Though I would argue that 
as adults who don't have limitations or restrictions put on us, I could buy bags of Skittles and just always have Skittles with me if I wanted to. So why couldn't other individuals, right? So really, really, can we not meet their needs? But let's say, okay, sometimes the environment is not going to meet the needs of the individual. That's when we need to use differential reinforcement. I'm going to say this is like 45% of our behavior intervention plan here is that differential reinforcement, teaching our individual how to get their needs met in an environment that is not already meeting their needs. So these would be teaching behaviors that serve the same function, like self-advocacy, like asking for what you need or performing certain things um, to get that need met in the most efficient way. Like if you have a headache, instead of banging your head, take some aspirin. Let me teach you how to self-administer aspirin when you have a headache. Um, but getting, where are my hands? Getting the learner to advocate for their needs, getting them, teaching them how to get their needs met in the most efficient way. That might be by teaching them sort of what are the common rules or expectations in this setting. So if somebody wants attention, um, you know, trying to get the teacher's attention in a classroom, probably the most efficient and effective way is going to be raising their hand, right? Um, and we can teach the learner that. We can teach and we can practice and reinforce that. Now, the key with this uh, self-advocacy and, and teaching the individual how to meet their needs in the most efficient and effective way um, is identifying what's being reinforced in the environment. So if one teacher doesn't ever call on anybody that raises their hand, then raising your hand is not going to be the most efficient and effective way to recruit the teacher's attention in that classroom. So sometimes the skills that we practice are also discriminating when a certain strategy is going to work and when it's not gonna work. Or if you raise your hand and the teacher tells you to put your hand down, then what's another strategy you can do to get the teacher's attention when you need the teacher's attention? And these are really important skills. These are skills that, um, that we have, uh, that we work on with adults in, in our professional environment, in our personal lives, is um, communicating with people about what you need and, um, and how, um, how you need your needs met, right? So that is a huge part. And we don't wanna just teach like one way, we wanna teach so many different ways so that our individual does not have to rely upon that one overly adapted skill um, because that's why it's overly adapted, right? It, it works in some settings, but it is generalized to other settings where it shouldn't be the primary skill that they use. Give lots of other skills, give lots of ways to get their needs met if the environment isn't already meeting their needs. But first of all, try and meet the learner's needs. Then differential reinforcement, teach how to get their needs met in an environment that is not supporting them. Now, at the very end, um, I would say that that is where there's the possibility that you might need to use extinction. If the environment didn't meet their needs, and all of the strategies that the individual has been taught were used and were ineffective at getting the learner's needs met, then they may go back to that overly adapted behavior that does work eventually, right? And if they do, then that might be where you need to use extinction. And extinction would be not reinforcing that particular behavior. Now, sometimes when we talk about extinction and we had an earlier one that talked about extinction, sometimes when people think extinction, they think they're just being ignored completely or um, 
or or something else right that they're being forced to do something right depending upon what you're trying to um use extinction for now it doesn't need to be that way um you can ignore or not provide attention as a reinforcer for a behavior without ignoring the individual I can pretend like you're not yelling and I can continue to talk to you calmly and to help you calm down without doing what's probably been the reinforcer, which is yelling back and escalating the situation or something else, right? I can ignore the behavior, but not ignore the person. And that's really important to remember um, that that it's just the behavior. <laughs> um, if anybody has had uh, or had an experience with um, small children who, um, you know, want to scream and yell about a particular thing and, and you can't change that thing, um, you know, and the parent maybe just turns up the radio in the car, right? We're just going to... Um, sing along with the songs or we're just going to continue our drive we're just not going to pay attention to the screaming but we're still going to interact like we would if you weren't screaming okay so there's a way to do that now with um escape extinction which is the one where sometimes people think well then you're just forcing somebody to do it there are other ways to do that as well with escape extinction the idea is that what you don't want to do, um, if you're going to do extinction, is you don't want to let someone out of that demand contingent upon the overly adapted behavior that they're using. However, what does getting out of the behavior really look like? As an adult, I still have work demands, even if I put something off for a day. It's still on my to-do list. I'm still going to be held accountable for that in the future. So I can push things on a to-do list. I can push things down. I can come back to it later. I could do it tomorrow if necessary. Um, something I do is probably not going to remove that demand entirely, but I can delay it, right? So perhaps that is what extinction looks like, escape extinction might look like for a particular behavior. It's like, you know what? We're not doing it today. We're going to come back to it. We're going to come back to it later when we're calm, or we're going to come back to it tomorrow in tomorrow's class because today is just not happening and we're going to try again tomorrow. And that's okay. We're not sitting there forcing someone to engage in a behavior right now. The idea just is to start to break that connection between this is the most efficient way, this overly adapted behavior is the best way to get my needs met, and instead show it's not actually the best way to get your needs met. There are other ways to get your needs met. The other thing I would say, though, about extinction, if you are having to use extinction regularly, then you have not done the NCR and the DRA portion well enough. You should, if you know the function of the behavior, you should be able to meet that need and teach the individual how to advocate for themselves when that need is not being met. And if you can meet the need, then you could gradually meet the need less in order to set up more opportunities for self-advocacy, but then you could also switch it back, right? So if you're using extinction, I would argue that you have not done enough in your behavior plan for the other two steps, the non-contingent reinforcement, NCR, meeting the learner's needs, and the DRA, differential reinforcement, teaching the learner how to get their needs met. So Extinction might occur sometimes, but if it does, I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at my behavior plan and I'm going to do more work because if my 
learner is having to fall back on that overly adapted behavior, I haven't done a good enough job teaching and meeting their needs. So with that in mind, we're going to talk about what function-based interventions might look like for the different, the four different types of reinforcers, the four functions of behavior. So if you remember, we've talked about the four functions of behavior before. Things are either social, involve another person to deliver, or automatic, the behavior itself produces the response, and either positive, we added to the environment, or negative, we removed from the environment. So you end up with social positive, social negative, automatic positive, automatic negative. Everything should fit into one of those four categories. So if we want to, uh, it, for an example, for a function-based intervention for behavior maintained by social positive reinforcement, which means that another person has to deliver the reinforcer and the reinforcer adds something to the environment, social positive. Perhaps an example might be in CR, we are providing the type of, let's say it's attention that the individual needs. Yeah, here we go. Um, at a frequency more often than the rate of the overly adapted behavior. We're gonna arrange the environment such that the preferred person is available to attend to the learner frequently. So if my social positive, uh, reinforcement is attention from a particular individual, then let's meet that need. Let's have that individual there. Let's have them attending to the learner more often than the learner engages in the overly adapted behavior, therefore meeting the needs so that our learner doesn't need to engage in the overly adapted behavior. The DRA teach the individual how to uh, efficiently and effectively recruit attention when they are not receiving enough attention. So raising their hand, approaching the person, tapping them on the shoulder, standing near them, calling their name, showing something, asking someone to watch, et cetera, et cetera. How can my learner advocate for themselves, recruit attention in the most efficient and effective way in that environment if the environment is not meeting their needs. Now, if we didn't do enough here and our learner still has to use that overly adapted behavior, then in the moment, our extinction might be that we um, identify what's the appropriate uh, topography of extinction. So we could ignore the behavior, but not the learner. We might ignore the learner but not the behavior and that would look like if an individual is running out towards the road to get attention right like i don't know that that's why but we're going to hypothetically they're doing something dangerous to get attention i can't let them run into the street because i can't let them get hurt so i'm going to keep them safe i'm going to maintain safety but I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to, you know, make a big deal out of it. I'm just going to maintain safety. Um, possibly there might be a situation where uh, the learner and the behavior, we can just walk away. Um, I know with uh, my own child, you know, sometimes they just need to express that frustration, get it out give themselves a moment, get themselves collected. If they're in a safe spot and their behaviors are not dangerous, sure, we just step away, we ignore the behavior, give the learner space, and then we can come back to it when everybody is there. Ideally, however, the behavior is reduced through the use of NCR and DRA, and you never need to use extinction if you've done a good enough job here. If you haven't, then you might need to use it and then you need to immediately go back and evaluate your behavior plan to improve it and meet the learner's needs. Now, what about function-based interventions for behavior that's maintained by social negative reinforcement? So let's say escape from a demand in this case. So our NCR, we're gonna provide relief from that situation that the learner finds aversive 
at a frequency more often than the occurrence of the overly adapted behavior. We're going to adjust the environment to provide more supports needed to make that activity less aversive, if we even have to do that activity at all. If we don't have to do that activity, then let's get rid of it, right? If my kid doesn't like piano lessons, do I have to make them go to piano lessons? Probably not. So let's just quit piano lessons because they hate it. So great. Let's let's just end that battle. This is not a battle we have to fight. So let's meet the learner's needs. DRA. Let's teach the individual how to appropriately seek relief when the situation becomes too much to manage. That might be taking a break. That might be putting on some headphones. That might be closing their eyes, taking a walk, asking for additional support, negotiating the amount of task that they have to complete, etc. Lots of different ways that we put off stuff that we don't want to do or negotiate out of things that we don't want to do teach our learners those same strategies. Now, if we didn't do enough here, it's possible we might need to use extinction. If we have to use extinction, it could look a little bit different depending upon the topography of the situation. It's possible we might follow through with some physical assistance. For example, if I have a toddler, who doesn't want to sit in their car seat, but we have to drive and I can't drive with my toddler not in the car seat, then I might buckle them up for them, right? I might also, I might wait until they're ready, right? I might just sit there and we wait until the child is ready to sit. And, and that is also an option. Um, or if it's something, um, if it's a task that we can put off until later, um, we can leave it sort of on the to-do list and come back to it later, come back to it tomorrow. Eventually, we will work on this skill. But if we got to the extinction portion, if we got to the portion where our learner is using that overly adapted behavior, then we didn't do enough up here anyway. So we already know we need to revisit our task so that we don't have to get to here again. All right, um, function-based behavior interventions for automatic positive. So automatic positive reinforcement is going to be something that um, the individual, uh, the behavior they are using produces the response. So it doesn't require another person. It produces the kind. Um, it produces the reinforcement just by engaging in that behavior. So in CR, what is that sensation, stimulation? Um, what is that reinforcer that they want? Let's give it to them. Give them that in the environment. Um, if they like music, let's play more music. If you know, if they're if they're engaging. Um, if they're singing, uh, these might be some of those like self-stim behaviors, um, whatever it is, whatever that input is that they're seeking, they're adding to their environment, let's provide it in their environment. Let's provide it at a frequency more often than the occurrence of the overly adapted behavior. Let's arrange the environment so that the learner has lots of interesting options to choose um, which ones and how to engage with them. Then DRA, Let's teach them how to appropriately seek out the stimulation that they need when it's not already in the environment. So this might be um, going and getting some fidget toys, engaging in certain body movements, drawing, writing, exercise, asking for a hug, requesting a specific activity, etc. Whatever they can do to meet those needs in their environment when the environment isn't already meeting those needs. Now. If that doesn't work, we might get to extinction. And for extinction, it would require response interruption and redirection because the behavior produces the reinforcer itself. So the only way that you would sort of break that connection between the behavior and the reinforcer is to actually stop or block the occurrence of the behavior. Now, this is not easy to do and it's not fun to do for either the implementer 
or the learner, I would argue. So if you get to this point, basically what this means is that you didn't do enough here. So go back, meet the needs in their environment and work on ways that they can self-advocate and get those needs met. And then uh, finally, the fourth function, function-based interventions for problem behavior. Uh, oh, I said problem behavior there behavior that's a typo um, for behavior maintained by automatic negative reinforcement so automatic negative reinforcement is generally going to be um, behavior that is removing an aversive stimuli and that the behavior itself gets rid of the stimuli so in cr we need to know what is aversive and we need to provide relief from that sensation that is aversive. This might be by addressing medical conditions, by addressing mental health, discomfort, pain, or any other underlying issue. We also want to arrange the environment so that the environment is not aversive to the individual. So let's figure out what part is aversive and let's get rid of it. Um, let's meet those needs if they have uh, private events, medical, um, health, mental health, things that are creating that aversive situation. Let's address those so that there's no aversive that somebody has to get rid of. Then DRA, let's teach the individual how to appropriately seek relief when the sensation is aversive or when it does pop up in an environment. For example, maybe they're taking medicine, maybe they're putting on headphones, they're taking a nap, they're drinking water, eating food, notifying a caregiver that they are feeling pain in their teeth or a headache, closing the blinds, turning the music down, et cetera, whatever it, need, it is that they need to do to remove that aversive in uh, the most efficient and effective way. Now, again, if we got to the extinction, that means we didn't do enough here, if we got to extinction, extinction for automatic behaviors does require response interruption and redirection because the behavior produces the reinforcer itself. However, ideally, the behavior is reduced through the NCR and the DRA. And especially when we're talking about automatic negative reinforcement, if you got to the extinction, that means that there is still an aversive occurring and you need to address it. You need to help the individual get rid of that aversive stimuli, that, aver that aversive situation so that they can go on and do anything else, all right? So for the assignment, um, identify and describe the three components of a function-based intervention plan, NCR, DRA, EXT. Write an operational definition for three overly adapted behaviors and specify the function of each behavior. You can make this up. You don't need to figure out an exact function for a learner. Say, Johnny is doing this, that, and the other, and the function is blank right? Now you're going to write a function-based intervention plan for the three overly adapted behaviors that you identified using the function that you hypothesize. This is all hypothetical. This is not real people, not real learners. Um, we are not actually implementing these interventions. We are discussing hypotheticals and um, planning what we might do in those hypothetical situations. So if you wanted to, you can pop your comments and questions and assignments into the comment section below. I'm happy to provide feedback. And if you'd like to, please subscribe so that you know when we have more of these coming out. And thank you so much. <laughs>